All right. Chris yes. Winther. How's my buddy Chris doing? I'm very well, Wayne. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can definitely hear you. So you're down in uh, San Diego, sheltering in place? That's correct. I actually got to play golf today. All right. And I guess all the courts are closed, but that doesn't really matter for you. So, <laughs> well, let me introduce Chris Winter. He's, um, he's one of my favorite per people to uh, keep me out of jail. <laughs> uh, Chris is a legal expert, an attorney down in San Diego, and he handles uh, all uh, vessel transactions. And I think you also do plane transactions as well. But Chris is worth his weight in gold. He'll keep you out of trouble. Um, he'll show you the way around the, uh, the, the California sales use tax um, and also knows about property tax, LLCs, um, and different ways to purchase a boat, whether the boat's out of the country and coming in, um, and all sorts of cool things on boat purchase. So Chris, you want to take it away? Yeah, so I think today I think it'd be good to talk about if you're buying a boat, how you should take title to the boat and things that you should be aware of. So first things that you need to be aware of. The first thing that we always like to determine is whether or not you're going to use the boat for personally, uh, per, uh, pure personal use or if you're gonna use it for a business use for charter. If you are going to use a boat for charter for business purposes, then you need to know more about the boat you're buying. If it is a foreign built boat and um, it's not at least three years old, uh, that uh, that boat cannot be chartered legally in the United States because of the Jones Act. If that foreign built boat is at least three years old, you can apply for what's known as a Merad waiver. That is a division of the U.S. Coast Guard located in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's the Marine Administration. So if your boat, if your foreign built boat is at least three years old, um, and uh, you can apply, it's a $500 filing fee, it takes about three to five months to get the, uh, the waiver approved. And um, it's, it's published in the Federal Register. And people can object if they believe that your business is going to interfere with their business that happens to deal with a US built boat. You don't see that too much, but you do see it happens from time to time in, uh, for example, San Diego Bay, Bay where you have maybe a an America's Cup boat, uh, they'll watch the website for the, for the filing and then you can object to it. So what we don't wanna see is you thinking that you're gonna buy a boat, you're gonna go into the charter business, but you, you forgot to ask the, you know, the question and, or understand what's allowed in the United States. So assuming your boat is either, if your boat's US built, uh, you can charter it immediately. If your boat is under hundred gross tons, you can carry uh, at least six passengers uh, for hire on that boat. If your boat is over 100 gross tons, uh, commonly known as a 12-pack charter, you can carry 12 people. So if you have a foreign-built boat, same rule. Um, as long as uh, you've got that Marad waiver and U.S. Customs duty is paid on it, and your U.S. Coast Guard documentation has a Coastwise Trade endorsement on it, you can charter that boat with, for hire. If you have a foreign-built boat, that uh, is not, um, it, it does not have a Merad waiver um, and it's not US or if, if it doesn't have, doesn't have a, a Merad waiver, you can still charter that boat provided that the boat is US Customs duty paid. Um, in that situation, that has to be a bare boat charter, a demise charter. And the Coast Guard is cracking down very much now on uh, bare boat demise charters uh, because for the safety of, um, of, the, of the general public. You're not allowed to provide a captain when you are uh, when you when you are bare boat or demise chartering it. So and, the first, and they have to um, supply their own insurance too, right? Yes, and you need to notify your insurance company because you will pay an increased premium when you are going to be in the in the charter in the charter business. So you know, many times we talk, we hear clients they want to talk they talk about chartering a boat, and the first thing we ask them is, your, you know, where's your boat built? Is it U.S. built or is it foreign built? And then most people are unaware of the fact that if it is a foreign built boat, you are not allowed to charter that boat with captain and crew. When you apply for your Merad waiver, uh, you, in your, in your application, 
in the old days, we would ask for Miami to uh, up, uh, up to Maine and then from San Diego to Alaska. Well, the, the um, Marriott is no longer, they don't want that anymore. They want you to really pick the area that you want to choose. The beautiful thing about a Marriott waiver is it doesn't go to you as the applicant. It actually stays with the boat. So it actually increases the value of your boat. Um, so, but, but if you are on the West, if you're on the West coast of the U S I would always ask for San Diego all the way up to Alaska. You will never get Southeast Alaska and the, uh, area, uh, there's a certain area up, um, uh, in, uh, there's a certain bay up there, but you won't, you won't get as well. And I have that information if you're interested, but, uh, don't even bother trying to get it because if you ask for it, it's going to get rejected because those charter boat companies up in Alaska, that is their bread and butter, and they will object every time, and your application is going to be denied. But generally, you'll be able to get from San Diego all the way up to Alaska with those two areas excluded um, in, in, uh, in Alaska. It, it's very, if, if, if you're going to be chartering, if you are going to charter in Alaska, which is a very hot charter market right now, uh, I, you, you really need that Marriott waiver. Trying to do a bare boat charter, Coast Guard is really cracking down. There were some fines last last season in excess of 150,000 uh, bucks. A couple of boats got caught uh, with an illegal uh, bare boat charter. The next thing, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, that that's uh, really serious. I know up here in San Francisco they started cracking down also on those uh, illegal charters. Uh, so yeah, you got to be really careful with that. So the next thing I think I, I'd like to talk about is how should I own my boat? So you probably noticed all the advertisements on the internet for boats for sale that a boat is in a, in a LLC. Um, we hope never to see the boat is in a transferable LLC because that's really not for, you know, brokers shouldn't be determining that. That's a very complex issue. But how should I own my boat? Generally speaking, we recommend that everybody, if the boat's 150 grand or up, we recommend you simply, you put it in a limited liability company. And, and the reason you, you do that, if you're going to pay tax on your purchase, you have a tax paid boat in a limited liability company. Down the, it's not going to help you much. You're paying the tax. If, if, if you're one of those taxpayers that don't want to do an offshore delivery, but down the road, when you sell your boat, the next person, they're not going to want to buy your boat. They're actually going to want to buy the membership interest in your limited liability company that owns your boat. The law in California has been clear for about 75 years. There is no, in California, does not assess sales or use tax on the purchase and sale of intangible personal property and stock in a corporation, uh, an, an LLC membership interest. That's intangible personal property. So generally speaking, the perfect structure that we like to see is the boat is owned by a limited liability company and the sole member of that limited liability company is your inter vivos revocable trust if you have a trust for estate planning purposes. If you don't have a trust for estate planning purposes, then it's typically owned by you and your, if you're married, your spouse as husband and wife as community property with rights of survivorship. So if the husband dies, it automatic, the membership interest goes to the wife, the wife dies, it goes to the husband. So that's the, and that is, and having an entity is the cheapest extra insurance you're ever going to find anywhere in the world. The, 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 what, where we slipping and falling is, you know, is what obviously we're worried about. You normally have a, a, a good marine insurance policy. And in my career of 36 years of doing this, I have not seen an above limits insurance uh, claim where someone's actually gone against the individual. So as long as you keep your a, a reasonable amount of insurance in place, uh, I don't think you're going to have a problem. But it is nice to have that extra layer of liability protection, not just for slipping and falling, but for environment and environmental issues. That's that strange situation where you're you're off your boat and your bilge pump, uh, there, there's some kind of an oil leak and the bilge gets um, uh, pumped into the bay. That's strict liability. And that's a $10,000 minimum fine. You can uh, negotiate that, but generally it's a ten thousand dollar fine if you start pumping um, uh, oily water into the into the bay. So, and and where should I form my limited liability company? If you're going to be in the charter business, uh, the LLC will need to be either uh, established in California or qualified to do business in California. 
generally speaking, we do not like to see California limited liability companies and clients don't like them. And here's the reason why. California is uh, the only state that requires that you, uh, I'm sorry, California and Rhode Island are the only states that require that you file a tax return for a single member limited liability company. And a husband and a wife are treated as one person in, in all community property states. So uh, California has all a $800 minimum tax as well. So you'll have an $800 minimum tax every single year, even though you have no income, and then you're going to have to file California Form 568, which your accountant's generally going to charge you somewhere between $750 and $1,000. And then you have your statement of information fee. So before you know it, you're spending about $2,000 a year in maintenance, in maintenance fees. We normally recommend Colorado. Colorado is $10 a year to the Secretary of State. The registered agent is $95 uh, bucks a year. There's no tax returns. There's no minutes. That's what we normally recommend. But if you are doing business, you would need to qualify that Colorado LLC to do business in California. And now you're back to the $800 minimum tax and having to file the annual form uh, 568. But uh, if you're not going to form, uh, if you're not going to use an LLC, uh, then we would, the, you, the, the member, or you should take title generally in the name of your inter vivos trust just to avoid probate if uh, either you or your spouse die or you pass away, to, or if you have a stroke to make it easy to dispose of, of, your, of your assets. Uh, as far as Coast Guard documentation versus uh, state registration, uh, generally, generally Coast Guard documentation is uh, significantly cheaper. It's $26 a year. Uh, the US Coast Guard has now implemented a five year uh, uh, application so you, you get, we see a lot of people that forget to renew their Coast Guard documentation. They're out there, you know, for years with a uh, lapsed uh, registration. Uh, and that can actually be a problem under your insurance policy. Because if you're actually not operating the boat, if you're operating the boat illegally under your insurance policy, you do run the risk of your insurance policy denying, denying a claim because the boat is being operated illegally. That, so, but, the um, so five year renewal is what we normally just go for a five year, you know, for 26 bucks a year, you can't go wrong. State registration, um, it's okay, uh, it's good, it's okay for tenders and things like that. Or if you lost your tender, uh, there's some creative things you can do if you in your boat transaction where you've got a tender on board and they've lost the tender, you can do what's called a statement of fact, and then you that we work with a local documentation officer and you can register it with a, with a statement of fact. Um, so that that's very helpful there. With, if you're doing an offshore delivery, I would never do a, a California state registration because with California state registration, in order to register your boat, you have to pay the tax upfront at the time of registration. So it doesn't make any sense. If you're going, so if you're going to do the offshore delivery, just use Coast Guard documentation. And then Coast Guard documentation versus foreign flag. So there's a, there's really. I don't believe there's a lot of good reasons why you would ever use a foreign flag for the general yacht owner on this coast. Most people, they fly a foreign flag because it makes it easier for foreign crew to get a B1, B2 visa. Now, it's a complete misnomer that, you, that, the, that a foreigner cannot work on a U.S. flag boat. A foreigner can work on a U.S. flag boat, provided that they have the proper uh, B-1, B-2 visa. In order to get a B-1, B-2 visa, crew members must work on a boat that hails out of a non-U.S. port. So even though you're a U.S. flag boat with a San Francisco hailing port on your stern, that yacht still may hail out of a non-U.S. port. For example, if that yacht is spending six or seven months a year in Mexico, that yacht is hailing out of a foreign port. It is hailing out of uh, Mexico. So with that fact pattern, that uh, crew member should be able to get a B1, B2 visa and work on your boat. It's also a misnomer that a, uh, you cannot have a foreign captain on your yacht. You can have a foreign captain on your recreational yacht as long as that captain has the B1, B2 visa. And in order to get the B-1, B-2 visa, again, the boat must, must generally hail out of a non-U.S. port, meaning it's spending most of the time in Canada or Mexico or somewhere else. 
Um, so, you know, for to maintain a U.S. Coast Guard documented boat, 26 bucks a year. If you're going to go to BVI or Cayman or Marshall Islands or St. Vincent, you're going to you're going to spend about 2000 bucks a year in maintaining that flag status. And in some of the flag states, BVI, uh, Cayman, uh, uh, particularly, you have to have a registered agent in these third world countries. And I find them to be expensive and uh, they, ge they, they generate, they run up fees for the sake of running up fees. And, uh, you know, it's a third world country and you're getting charged and sometimes, you know, four, four or five, 600 bucks by a third, a, a lawyer located in these third world countries. So generally speaking, um, you know, I would stay away for, from a foreign flag boat. Now, if you're a very large yacht and you're going to be cruising all over the world and the majority of your, of your um, uh, crew is foreign, yeah, maybe in that situation, the, the, uh, a foreign flag makes sense. As far as the structure of a foreign flag, the, the cheapest structure in the entire world uh, uh, is going to be using a Marshall Islands uh, company. It's, it's the same price now as a Delaware limited liability company. So that, and that I, I typically use for the large yachts, I use a Marshall Islands uh, company with a Cayman flag. Mm -hmm. uh, the cheapest is, and the cheapest and easiest to use is the, is the uh, Jamaican flag. But for purposes of this discussion today, uh, most of you, this is beyond the scope of really what you wanna hear, uh, but you can choose any flag you want. Now, one thing you should be aware of, this is, and this is, this is very important, and this is really important for any broker that's listening today. If you have a U.S. built vessel that is over 200 gross tons, you never want to foreign flag that boat. If you foreign flag a, for example, a Westport, let's say you've got a Westport uh, 130, and let's say it's coming in at, uh, you know, 215 uh, GT. If you foreign flag that boat, that yacht is forever poisoned from ever coming back to U.S. Coast Guard documentation and obtaining a coastwise trade endorsement. Now, remember, in order to legally charter, you have to have a coastwise trade endorsement. And that's even if you have your little 35 foot uh, uh, sailboat or your, your run of your power boat, you, when you file for your Coast Guard documentation, you need to add the Coast Wise trade endorsement to your registration. There is no extra charge for that endorsement. So it's, it's you know, sometimes if you'll see a registration on a boat, it'll be, it'll say recreational, it'll say registry, and it'll say Coast Wise trade. And uh, there's no extra charge for asking for all three of those endorsements. So when that boat is being operated commercially in the U.S., you're operating under your Coast Wise trade endorsement. When you're operating that boat just for fun around San Francisco Bay or uh, local waters, you're going to be operating under your recreational endorsement. When you are operating that boat in Mexico under some kind of a charter program, under a, but remember, you have to use a Naviara down there. Now you're operating under the registry endorsement. So there's no extra charges for those endorsements, uh, but you have to have those endorsements. And, and uh, so just be, just be aware of that. Um, hey, Chris, you mentioned Coast Guard doc, or actually, let me back up. You mentioned when you do a state registration that you pay the sales tax immediately. How about when you do Coast Guard documentation? No, when you get so there's a this uh, that's a good question. I want to point out two issues. Uh, some people believe first there, there's a misnomer that people believe that if a boat is U.S. Coast Guard documented, that that boat is U.S. Customs duty paid. That is an absolute falsity. It's very important when you as a buyer are buying a foreign built boat, or you are you're a broker representing a buyer that's buying a foreign built boat. The first thing that you're going to ask for is a copy of CBP form 7501, which is proof that that uh, boat it has paid, US, there's, U.S. Customs duty has been paid on that boat. Very, very important. So there's the, when your Coast Guard documented, it, the U.S. Coast Guard cares nothing about U.S. Customs duty. They care nothing about local sales and use taxes. Um, one more thing that you need to be aware of, 
And I think Wayne, you actually were, I think you were involved in this one case where we had a sailboat coming from the South Pacific, I believe. Yeah. And we had, uh, we had an, uh, we, we had an, uh, uh, it was a foreign, it was a foreign uh, built vessel. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to bring it back to Coast Guard documentation. And we had to make sure that the engine was US EPA compliant. So, and in that case, we actually had to, we had to, we had to change out the Yanmar engine in order to make, to make that boat legal in the United States. So another thing you need to be aware of is if you are buying a foreign flag, if you're buying a foreign flag boat, that transaction has taken on a completely uh, higher level of scrutiny than if you're buying a U.S. Coast Guard documented boat. If you're buying a foreign flag boat, in my opinion, I believe you're making a mistake if you are not going to get a maritime lawyer involved in that transaction. There are for a number of reasons. If it's in a foreign country, we you've got to we've got to make sure it's back paid. Well, we got to it's a, it can be a very complicated closing. And the first thing we want to find out is can we even buy this boat and bring it legally back to the U.S. under U.S. flag? Because otherwise, you could be stuck bringing that boat into the U.S. and having to to fly a foreign flag on that boat because the engines do not meet EPA standards. So this is beyond uh, this the discussion today. But uh, at a different time, we could actually maybe learn. I can teach you guys how to read an uh, an, an engine. Uh, it is very important as brokers. As uh, the first thing that I want on a foreign, uh, really any boat. But on a foreign bill boat, I want a picture of every single engine placard affixed to those engines. Because I am looking for what's called a family engine name. It is a 12-digit uh, name comprised. Of, it's almost like a hull number, but it's, not, it's, it's similar to a hull number. Um, but with that family engine name, we can go through this uh, incredible EPA database and run a search on that to find out if that engine is approved. And if it's approved, you're, you're, you're home free. But there are many transactions in 2019, large yacht, multi-million dollar yacht transactions that we have had to terminate and cancel because the engines were, it were not EPA compliant. And this is even on some brand new engines on some large trawlers that we were looking at out of, out of Poland. Uh, those, there was no way to make those and that that boat EPA compliant. It would have to have run with a foreign flag, and the owner did not want to with a with a, uh, run with a foreign flag. In fact, the owner wanted to charter the boat. So you don't want to have your dreams dashed. If you're buying a foreign flag boat and you think you're going to charter that boat, that is a whole nother level of complexity uh, to make sure that that boat is EPA compliant. They, it can even be legally imported into the United States. Yeah, let me ask you about the question we get all the time with contracts and it's really confusing and it has to do with state uh, property tax, personal property tax. So um, the owner is assessed on January 1st, the tax. We have an owner that's selling the boat, a buyer that's buying on June 1st. Who pays that property tax? How does that work? Okay. This is the number one bone of contention <laughs> where we have weeping and gnashing of teeth almost in every MIPA. A MIPA is a membership interest purchases agreement, which in California is probably constitutes 60 to 70% of all vessel transactions now. <clears throat> I would say are MIPA, not outright vessel purchase sales. Here's the rule, and it's I'm going to give you a couple of examples to make it maybe easier to understand. So everyone is familiar with the general rule. Whoever owns that boat as of January 1st is liable for the property tax. So let's take an example. It's now it's February 1st. You're listing your boat for sale. Wayne finds uh, he finds a buyer uh, under the MIPA and, and, and they're doing a transaction and um, and the, the seller says, uh, you know, buyers should be paying for the tax. Uh, it's February 2020. And uh, it's, so the buyer should be paying that, that, that February, that, that 2020 tax bill. That 2020 tax bill generally comes out between May and August. Uh, different counties have different times. But uh, 
the answer to that question is no. The uh, that buyer should uh, never pay property tax in that situation, because, because the way property taxes work in California, whoever owns that boat as of January first is responsible for the tax. And now this is where it gets confusing. So that boat gets sold on February first uh, of 2020, and now you have an absolutely irate seller because the seller has his, he gets the property tax bill and that property tax bill says this property tax bill is for the fiscal year 7120 through 63021 how in the heck why should i have to pay the, uh, the 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 property tax on this i sold it on february 1st the fiscal year hasn't even begun until july why why is that fair so, and, and the reason is it's uh, it's a misunderstanding of how property taxes are assessed and how the money is spent. So for, in this example, that who, he, the seller owned the boat as of January 1, 2020. And the test period to determine whether or not that boat had situs, S-I-T-U-S, for purposes of property taxes is for the 12 month period prior to the lien date. So. The tax, the what, the January 1st, 2020 tax is for the benefits conferred upon that vessel between the period 1119 and 123119. And that's why it's fair to charge the person that owned it as of January 1 with the 2020 tax bill because it relates to the benefit conferred on that boat for the prior 12 month period. So I hope I hope that answered your question. The, but the money is spent and collected in a in a subsequent period. The money is spent for that is, that is collected in uh, typically June of 2020. It's spent during that fiscal year of uh, July 1, 2020 through 630, 2021. That's just when the money is spent. But the tax relates to the test period. Now that test period is important for a variety of reasons. Many of our clients, uh, especially the larger boats or the trawlers, those clients never pay property tax. They do not pay property tax because their boat does not have situs as of January 1 of each year. And that's because the large boats or the trawlers, uh, the majority of those clients they are crew, they're, they're heading to Mexico typically in October, and they're down in Mexico all the way until May. Now, so they're in California for about four to five months a year. And so the, it's a very, it's a difficult concept, but CITUS is a constitutional concept. It's, and there's, if anybody ever tells you there's a black and white test, they're lying to you. There is no black and white test. And when and people will like to talk about a magic six month period, there is no magic six month period. But but the six month period is important for me. Uh, that kind of dictates whether or not I'll take your property tax case if you're trying to get out of it. If you've been here for more than six months and 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 you've been here for just pure enjoyment, uh, recreational use, I can tell you after handling handle, have, having handled thousands of assessment appeals cases, you're going to lose on, on assessment appeal. Don't waste your time. If you're but, here on January 1st. Well, that's so that's not necessarily true. Now, so um, that's not necessarily true. So let's just say, for example, um, that you came in, um, you're, a, you're a trawler client that spends half a year in Mexico and half a year up in Alaska or Canada or wherever. But you happen to come in in October and for a, maybe a, a pretty major um, engine uh, job. And you're here from October until January 5th. There's a very strong argument that that boat uh, does not have situs as of January 1 because um, uh, it, situs is not where the boat is located. So your boat could be in Fiji on January 1, but yet your boat could have situs. And the example would be as follows. If you were here from that prior January all the way through October, and in October of that year, you took your boat down to the South Pacific and you were in Fiji for a cruise, there is a very strong argument that you still owe property tax on that boat, even though your boat is in Fiji, because your boat has situs. Situs is it's a it's a degree of connectivity. It's a fairness concept. 
how much time, if you have spent a significant amount of time in the state of California and been, and you've been reaping the benefits of the police, fire protection, the, and the public infrastructure of, of, of your marina, you know, there is the argument that that boat has situs and you should be paying property taxes. Now, the hot issue right now, what, which we have been involved uh, in many assessment appeals and which we are getting close to litigation on, on, on a certain case is what's really unfair is this. If you have a situation where let's say you, are, you, you, buy, a, you buy a brand new boat uh, and uh, you bring it in in say September and it's only here for five months, but yet it's it's uh, you know you you're gonna you're gonna keep it here permanently. So uh, we, we come to January one of the next year. You've only been here for five months, and you've got situs. And the question is, well, how come I don't get to pay five twelfths of the of the one percent property tax it's called apportionment? Because aircraft are allowed to apportion their uh, their property taxes based upon ground time in California versus ground time outside of California. Uh, you know, most most large commercial vessels don't pay any tax at all, but it's all part of this situs this situs issue. And the issue is, uh, when the moment a boat goes out three miles, you are now involved in international commerce. The moment you're out three miles, you are in international commerce. And if you're going to be going back and forth between California, Mexico, California to a different state, California up to Canada, there is a very strong argument that that. That that property tax should be apportioned based upon the, nine, the the time that that boat is actually in California, versus the the full twelve twelfths, and that's where that's where most clients, uh, taxpayers in California, really get upset when they're here for uh, for five months or six months and they get hit for a twelve month tax property tax bill. Those same clients would have no problem paying a one percent property tax, five twelfths of that property tax, because that's fair. That's fair. But that all comes down to uh, to, to CITUS. So, but yeah, CITUS, unfortunately, it's, it's a 12 month look back period prior to January 1. That's why it's fair. If you sold your boat on February 2nd, don't get upset. Yes, you still owe the property tax for 2020 because the benefits were conferred on your boat from 1119 through 1231.19. And even though that money is going to be collected and spent in the fiscal year 7120 through 63021. So a seller that insists on prorating the property tax is going to pay more tax because he's going to prorate the following year. Now, yeah, now that, that we have not seen the market, uh, the, we have not seen it go that far, but you are exactly correct. Let's say you are, you're closing a transaction in <clears throat> October of, uh, of, of, 20, of 2020. Um, and you, now you as a selling, as a, I'm sorry, you as a listing broker, you as a listing broker, you can't, I'm sorry, you as a selling broker, um, uh, I mean, you can, you brokers can choose to make property tax a business issue by that little box you check on the CYBA form. Now, I always recommend you just do no proration because that follows yeah. the law. But think of the situation where you close it in October um, and you have proration. So the seller is uh, the buyer is now paying for 10 twelfths of that property tax bill, but that tax bill, for, I mean, technically that technically that seller should be paying the buyer for the, right. the, 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 the buyer is going to get a hit in 2021 for, for the 10 twelfths that the, that the seller owned the boat. So, but generally speaking, we don't see that 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 too often. But you brokers yeah. can choose to make it a business point. I recommend you not make it a business point and just follow the law. Yeah, we we try real hard. Hey, we got one quick question for you, Chris. Kevin, you want to read that for us? Yeah. Um, what's the disadvantage of keeping a foreign flagged boat in the SF Bay for a while until we can work together, work through the legal issues to get U.S. registered? I'm having a hard time hearing Wayne. I, I, yeah, I, I, I'll read that again. Um, what's the disadvantage of keeping a foreign flag vessel in San Francisco Bay for a while until we can work through the U.S. legal issues to get it U.S. registered? Okay, if I understand it, is there a downside to keeping a foreign flag vessel in the U.S. while you're getting the U.S. registration kind of worked out? Yeah. Um, 
there's so there's 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 nothing there's there's nothing wrong with that. But so let's talk about that. You're looking at a foreign flag boat, and so the first question you have to ask is, uh, is give me a copy of CBP form 7501. Is this a U.S. Customs duty paid boat? You that this boat in order to in order to list that boat for sale in the United States that boat must be a U.S. Customs duty paid boat. If you as a broker or a seller lists a foreign flag boat, um, a foreign flag, foreign built boat in, in the U.S., if you list it for sale, that boat is subject to confiscation by the U.S. Customs and the penalty is up to 100% of the fair market value of the boat and you as the broker can be liable for that penalty. So the, that's why it's so critical. And that's why when you go to these boat shows, you'll see not for sale to U.S. residents while, U, while in U.S. waters. That's because that's a non-U.S. Uh, customs duty paid boat. Yeah. And, a non, and a non-U.S. person should not be allowed even aboard that boat to look at that boat. So as a, as a selling broker or as a buyer, you're going to insist upon that seller showing you proof that that is a U.S. Customs duty paid vessel. So now you've got this uh, Marshall Islands flag uh, or Jamaican flag, foreign flag boat in San Francisco that you want to buy. And uh, you don't you don't have time to hand the deal for some reason to deal with the U.S. Uh, uh, flag reflagging at this point in time. So what you're going to do is you're going to do an offshore delivery more than three miles, but you are absolutely not going to go beyond 12 miles. 12 miles is the international boundary. The U.S. Customs has taken the position that if you have a U.S. Customs duty paid vessel and you, uh, you, and, and if, you for, if you sell that boat outside the United States, which is more than 12 miles offshore, you have forfeited that U.S. Customs duty paid status and you have to pay it all over again. So back to our example again, where the client wants a little bit more time to get their act together for their uh, for their U.S. flag. So you're just going to do a simple, if you want to pay the tax, just close your foreign, because it's a U.S. Customs duty paid boat, that's absolutely legal to close that transaction right at the dock. Close it at the dock and pay somewhere between, you know, your eight and, eight and three quarters and 10% uh, local sales tax up where you are and just pay the tax. And then you've got to go through the deletion process. Um, and uh, once you have your deletion process and every country is different and that's why, uh, again, you, I think you need to get a maritime lawyer involved because I would insist on a holdback of, uh, funds in, uh, that are, that stay in escrow until you get your deletion certificate from the foreign flag, because you cannot get your U S flag until you get the original deletion certificate for the foreign flag. Cause that needs to be tendered to the U S coast guard at the time you do your coast guard application, but also. Uh, you've got to go back to the due diligence that we just talked about earlier. You've got to make sure if you're going to U.S. flag that boat, you've got to make sure, get pictures of those engine placards, find out what the engine family, get the, get the engine family name, see if it, you can even legally import that boat into the U.S. flag, into the U.S., uh, under U.S. flag and bring it into the U.S. But yet the answer is there's nothing wrong with that. Now, one more example. This is, this is interesting as well. If you have a uh, foreign built, foreign flag boat that is U.S. Customs duty paid and your, your owner, your UBO, your beneficial owner, if your beneficial owner is a U.S. resident, you are entitled to, re- to obtain what's known as successive cruising licenses. So when you, when you buy a foreign flag boat, you can only be in this U.S. Uh, under uh, in one of two situations, you either have to uh, pay your $19 and go, go to U.S. Customs in Alameda, and you pay your $19 and get your U.S. cruising license. That's option one, which I recommend. Or option two, you have to deposit your original foreign flag ship papers with the port captain, which is an absolute hassle. Every time you want to move the boat, you got to go back to the to the customs. You got to pick up your original registration go do your little cruising and then go back and drop it back again. Pain, complete pain in the butt. Pay your $19, get your, you know, your one year cruising license. And uh, now you can freely travel in, in the, in the U S uh, for a year at a time. At the end of the year, 
If you are a non-U.S. citizen UBO, ultimate beneficial owner, uh, that boat has to go forward for at least 15 days. And so that's, a, that's kind of difficult for you up in San Francisco. That means you've got to go up to Canada or you've got to go, uh, you've got to go to, uh, down to Mexico. Now, we had some really uh, pro major problems during the America's Cup up in San Francisco where some of the big yachts were getting stuck up in San Francisco and their cruising li uh, permit uh, license was, was about to lapse. And uh, you know, in order to renew it, unfortunately, they had to make the run all the way up to Canada or all the way down to Mexico. Absolute hassle. So you got to always keep control of your cruising license. And when you leave the country for a long period of time, cancel your cruising license with uh, U.S. Customs and get a new one when you come back. So, if, but, if, but if you're a U.S. resident, you're entitled to get successive cruising license. So I send, I, I send somebody into U.S. Customs with a copy of the passport of a UBO <coughs> and show that they're a U.S. citizen and you, are, you, get, you pay your 19 bucks and you get another cruising license for another year. So it, technically, legally, you could have a foreign flag, uh, foreign built boat, duty paid boat that never leaves the U.S. to, be, to stay here the entire time. But why would you want to spend two thousand bucks a year between fifteen hundred and two thousand bucks a year on maintenance fees when you can pay twenty six bucks a year? Now, one more thing, two more, very important, very important. Uh, Chinese built boats. We all know they have a twenty five percent tariff, and that's in addition to the one and a half percent duty. So that's twenty six point five percent. If you're going to buy a Chinese built foreign, uh, for, a, a foreign built Chinese vessel, foreign flag, you got to think twice. Uh, number one, uh, you're going to be stuck with foreign flag unless you want to pay 26.5% custom wow. duty. Uh, so you've got to be aware of that. Now, if you're going to foreign flag it, each coast is different as how it's customs, uh, how they act. Alameda is a tough office. San Diego is a laid back office. Port Everglades is a police state office. Very difficult. If you have a Chinese built boat, multi-million dollar boat, and you are going to try to go into Florida, I think you, your, your owning entity to be safe because there are U.S. customs rulings out there that say if it's owned by a U.S. entity, and you can't have a U.S. entity with a foreign flag boat. That's completely allowed under almost every foreign flag jurisdiction. But if you are dealing with a high ticket duty like a foreign Chinese built boat, I think you've got to go with the foreign uh, foreign entity, the Marshall Islands entity that we talked about, and then you foreign flag it. Uh, but you're stuck with that foreign flag too, because what you're really hoping for is you're waiting for Congress and China to come to an agreement to get rid of that twenty that twenty five percent duty. And when you get rid of that twenty five percent duty, you're going to jump run into that office and you're going to pay that duty at one point five percent of the current fair market value. But this is what you need to know when you have a foreign. Uh, a foreign entity that you when you own a foreign entity it is a ten thousand dollar penalty per year and ten thousand dollars for every 30 peer, 30 day period that you fail to notify the irs after they notify you that you, if you fail to you have to notify the irs as a u.s citizen that you have an interest in a non-us uh, entity so that's why I, I i'm not a fan of any of you guys up there really having foreign flags and, and foreign entities so with this, with this foreign, if it's a foreign corporation, you've got to file this form uh, 5471 every single year. If you don't do it, $10,000 penalty uh, per year, no statute of limitations. If it's, a, if it's a foreign limited liability company, there's a different form. And if you are going to go with, a, sometimes you're forced to go into a foreign, uh, foreign entity for these Chinese built boats because they're just, you're not, you're not going to pay that 26.5% that duty. When you do so, when you do that, we as a I'm a, I'm a, my background. I'm a maritime lawyer and a tax lawyer. I have an L. I have two law degrees: your basic law degree and a second law degree in taxation. But anyway, so um, th what the reason I, that that's important is you just got to make sure you you know you file that form every <laughs> single year uh, to avoid that. Now, for those of you brokers or those of you who may not be U.S. citizens listening. The day of Delaware live, uh, corporations and LLCs, they're gone. It is a $25,000 annual penalty now for you as a non-U.S. citizen uh, uh, owning a, any type of a vessel under a U.S. entity and not notifying the IRS. All foreign clients now 
need to go to the Marshall Island structure. And so we're kind of moving most of the foreigners into the Marshall Islands Jamaican structure, or if it's a very fancy boat, the Jamaican uh, 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 Marshall Islands Cayman structure. We normally don't use Marshall Islands. We have a, it's, they're just very difficult to work with. Um, and BBI, we don't work with because you're dealing with these uh, third world um, agents again. But uh, so just be aware if you're not if you're not a U.S. A U.S. citizen, no more that the Delaware thing is a it's a loser. Now this is what else is a loser. They changed in January of this year. Delaware sent out a notice. You are because in the old days, where where would we register our tenders? Everything was registered in Delaware, um, uh, and so but now. Delaware, you must sign under penalty of perjury that the vessel is going to be used primarily in Delaware if you are going to, have to be a Delaware registered tender or vessel. So if you, heaven forbid, you have a client that maybe is not a U.S. citizen or they're trying to become U.S. citizens, it's a felony, obviously, to commit perjury. I'm not going to let a tender get, 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 a, get a client kicked out of the United States for filing a statement under penalty of perjury that the tender is being used primarily in Delaware. So now we're being forced to really go back to register, uh, registering our, 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 our tenders in, Cal in California, still pretty easy, but you gotta pay the tax. Uh, but typically we use a nominal value uh, or if we have our Colorado LLCs that I, that I use for all my entities, we just register those in Colorado for about $29. So um, anyway, I hope I answered the foreign flag person's question, but you just got it. There's a lot of issues when you're buying a foreign flag boat. Yeah. So Chris, this has just been phenomenal. You've given us so much information and there's still so much more. Uh, we didn't talk too much about offshore deliveries and uh, lots of other stuff, but let's I've let's been working with Chris for, I'm going to touch on that for a minute. So just, for, just so everybody understands the rule, the California resident test it is a true one-year test. The boat must stay out for one year, exclusive of time that the boat is in California for RRM, repair, retrofit, modification. You can have, if you do an offshore delivery and bring a boat in for a 13-month repair project, that is an exempt boat. At the, at the end of your 13-month repair project, you say you're saying you're buying a big work project. After, after, that, after that repair is done, just go out three miles, come back in. That is a tax-exempt boat. RRM must be done by a licensed third party. It can no longer, it cannot be done by you or your or your captain or your crew. It must be done by a licensed third party. Make sure you get business licenses for everybody. The non-resident test is a six-month test, um, and it, it can be com it can be comprised of time out of California and RRM as well. There's two prongs to the non-resident test. Boat cannot be stored or used in California for more than one half of the first six months and the boat cannot be subject to California property tax during the first 12 months. It's that second little tricky property tax thing that causes a lot of problems for deals closing this time of year. You might be stuck having to take it out still at the end of the year, just to make sure you don't get hit with 2021 property taxes. There you go. So I've been working with Chris for 10 years uh, and he is just a wealth of knowledge and uh, he really helps the, uh, the clients and Anytime I have anything more than just a simple act, uh, purchase, I send them over to Chris. And Chris is happy to talk to you for a little while, you know, and, and see what your situation is um, and uh, help you through these processes. But you really need somebody that knows better than me because I'm not an attorney. Chris is. And um, thanks for coming, Chris. It was great. And I hope everybody uh, really enjoyed it and got a lot of information out of it. All right. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you. See you.